Okay, hello and welcome to this tutorial, which is going to really sort of open us up to the discussion of strong acids and strong bases, uh, which is really the only type of acids and bases you've probably dealt with up until this point. So when we take a look at this particular reaction here, this is an acid-base reaction, more specifically a neutralization reaction that takes place between a strong acid and a strong base. Uh, specifically here it takes place between uh, nitric acid and sodium hydroxide. So I guess the first question we need to address is how do we know that we're dealing with a strong acid or a strong base? Um, well that's going to become a little bit more obvious as we progress through the unit and we identify what weak acids and weak bases are, but I'm going to put up a list here of the strong acids and strong bases that we have. Generally with a strong acid, if it has a halide in it, it is considered a strong acid unless that halide is fluorine. So hydrofluoric acid is not considered a strong acid, but the rest of them are. If we take a look at acids that contain oxygen, what we call oxyacids or oxoacids, uh, if it has two or more oxygen than the number of acidic hydrogen, then it is classified generally as a strong acid. So for example, you can see here with our acid, nitric acid, there are three oxygens, only one hydrogen, so we have two or more in this case two, oxygen greater than the number of acidic hydrogens, and so therefore this is a strong acid. Um, something like acetic acid, if you look, you'll notice that it has four hydrogens. Only one of those is actually an acidic hydrogen. It only donates one proton, as we say. It's monoprotic, and uh, this is usually indicated by putting the number of acidic hydrogens at the beginning of the formula, just to sort of distinguish between acidic hydrogens and non-acidic hydrogen. The reason that they're strong acids or strong bases is not because of the formula. This is just a mechanism or a way that we can remember what are strong and what are weak. Okay, so if you look at the balanced chemical equation that we have right here before us, you will notice that we have uh, an equation that we're fairly familiar with. We can see that we have an acid, a base, forming a salt, and water. And that doesn't change necessarily uh, if we're dealing with a strong or a weak acid or a base. But if we take a look at this, it's a traditional neutralization reaction. Now we would predict, ultimately, that this pH would be 7 if it's a true neutralization reaction. But we make that assumption that both the acid and the base are going to be completely used up. Now if they are both completely used up, then the only thing that remains is salt and water. And we know water has a pH of 7, assuming neutral conditions. And for the most part, up until this point, we assume that salts are also neutral. And the salt that is a product of a strong acid, strong base, is going to be neutral. That is, it's not going to affect the pH of water. And as we said, since the pH of water is 7, the salt doesn't impact it, and so our pH would be 7. But again, that's only true if the acid and the base have completely reacted. Meaning, if we can determine, or if we establish, that one of the acid or base is left over, then whatever's remaining, be it the acid or the base, that's going to impact the pH of the solution. And that's the scenario that we have here. So if we take a look at the question, we have 25 milliliters of 1.40 moles per liter nitric acid in a beaker that already contains 15 milliliters of a 2 mole sodium hydroxide solution. The question is asking us whether it's acidic or basic, and then ultimately it's going to ask us which ion contributes to this solution being acidic or basic, and our understanding at this point is that it's either the hydrogen ion or the hydroxide ion. And then we have to figure out, well, what's the concentration of the ion that's present? And we're going to extend this a little bit to help us figure out the pOH, the pH, and the concentration of both the hydrogen ion and the hydroxide ion here. So there are a lot of things that we're going to go through. And so this video is going to take a little bit of time to get through. So buckle up. So the first thing we're going to do is determine the number of moles of the acid in this case. And in this case, the acid is the nitric acid. We have to remember that it's a concentration times volume calculation that we're going to be doing. I have 1.40 moles per liter of my concentration. The volume in this case is 25 milliliters, which works out when converted to liters to be 0 0.0250 liters. I'm converting to liters because these units have to divide out and leave me with the value that I'm looking for, which in this case the number of moles being 3.50 times 10 to the negative 2 moles. So I've just converted into scientific notation because often that's easier to use, especially when dealing with very large or very small amounts. If we take a look now, we can establish what the number of moles of our base is. And in this case, our base is going to be the sodium hydroxide. We're going to be using the same formula. 
So I'm going to take my concentration, which is 2 moles per liter, and I am going to be multiplying it by my volume. Remember, right now we're just trying to figure out the initial number of moles. So we're not too worried about the fact that these things have been combined just yet. This works out to be 3 decimal zero, 0 times 10 to the negative 2 moles. Now we can see right away that these number of moles are not equal. Notice from the balanced chemical equation that it is a 1 to 1 ratio between the acid and the base. So if they were to truly neutralize, we would expect that the number of moles of acid should be equal to the number of moles of base. In this case, they are not. Now notice here, we don't really have to worry about the limiting reagent too much because it's a 1 to 1 ratio. If it were a ratio that was not 1 to 1, we would have to go through and perform a limiting reagent test to establish which one of these is limiting. However, in this case, we can see that the acid is going to be in excess. That is, because of that 1 to 1 ratio, we can see that we have more acid than base, and as a result, we are going to have some acid left over. Therefore, the acid is going to impact the final pH of our solution. So what we have to do now is figure out the number of moles of the acid that's in excess. That is, we've got to figure out how many moles of acid are left over. And anytime you want to figure out how much of anything is left over, you have to know two things. You have to know how much you started with and how much was removed. So in this case, the number of moles in excess really just means the number of moles left over. So initially, I started with 3.50 times 10 to the negative 2 moles of acid. Now, how do we know how much is used? Well, we have to remember that it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So in order for us to neutralize all of the base, we need an equivalent amount of the acid. So that means that we used 3.00 times 10 to the negative 2 moles of it to neutralize all of that base. Now what that leaves us with is a value of 5.00 times 10 to the negative 3 moles of the acid remaining. So now we have a value that tells us the number of moles of acid that are in excess in this solution. So in order for us to calculate the pH of this solution, we first have to calculate the concentration of the hydrogen ions in the solution. Now in order to do that, we have to understand that this was a mixture, that we mix the acid and the base together. So whatever solution remains is going to be a combination of the volume of the acids and the bases. So the total volume then of the solution that this acid exists in is going to be the volume of the acid initially, which was, you may remember, 25 milliliters, and we're adding that to the 15 milliliters of base that were originally in the solution. So in that case, we understand that the total volume of this reaction mixture is going to be 40 milliliters. Now since we know the amount of excess, in terms of the number of moles of the acid in here, and we know the volume, we can now start to calculate the concentration of the acid that's in here. So the concentration of the acid in the mixture is going to be the number of moles over the total volume. So that's going to give us 5.00 times 10 to the negative 3 moles divided by the volume of the entire mixture. And in doing so, we are going to get a value of 0.125 moles per liter. So what this provides us is the concentration of the acid in the mixture. There's no more base. The base is gone. So the base is not going to impact this. Remember, the acid neutralized the entire base, and now we have some acid remaining. So this is the acid and the acidic concentration that's going to impact our solution. Now you may recall that in terms of us calculating pH, pH is equal to the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. Now for the time being, we're going to call it the hydrogen ion concentration. We're going to come to learn it more accurately as the hydronium ion concentration. So what we need to understand before we go putting this value into our pH calculation is that this is the concentration of the acid remaining in that solution. What we also need to understand though is that this nitric acid is going to ionize completely, well approximately 100% into hydrogen ions and the nitrate ion.
in a one-to-one -one ratio between the acid and the hydrogen ion. So if we know the concentration of the acid, as we calculated above, then we can understand that that concentration of the hydrogen ion is going to be effectively the same as the concentration of the acid. So that's why we can take this number now and put it into our pH calculation. So our pH calculation is going to be the negative log of our value 0.125. Now this is where you have to be friends with your calculator. Either you are going to type it in, as you see it there, negative log of 0 0.125, or some calculators work in reverse, and you have to plug in the value, then hit log, and then hit negative. Either way, if you go through this calculation and you establish correctly, you are going to find a value of 0 0.903. Now this value here does have three significant figures. In pH calculations, because they're derived from logarithmic values, only the numbers to the right of the decimal are considered significant. So even though there's a zero there, if there wasn't, that number would still not be significant. Any numbers to the left of the decimal involving pH are not significant. Now you'll notice this pH is less than one, and that is perfectly fine. You can have negative pHs as well. Not extremely negative, but up to almost negative two in terms of the pH. So just because you have a really low pH value, or just because you have even a negative pH value, does not mean your calculation is wrong. Now this question not only asks us to calculate pH and the concentration of the hydrogen ion, it also asks us to calculate the concentration of the hydroxide ion, and it asks us to calculate the pOH. Now we understand water has a pH of 7, and we understand that pH is calculated by the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. But what we also need to understand is then, if that's how we calculate the pH of something, then water itself cannot be free of ions. Because if it didn't have any ions in it, then it couldn't have a pH. So water, in fact, does have ions in it. Water undergoes something that we call the auto-ionization of water. And so what that leaves us with is a value that we call Kw, or the water ionization constant. And we can see that it is determined by the product of the concentration of the hydrogen ions and the hydroxide ions. So what that means is, if we know that the Kw for water at 25 degrees Celsius is constant, then it's going to have the same value all the time. And in our cases, we can see that it's 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14, assuming again a constant temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. So we can see that the Kw is expressed as 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14. So if we know that, and we know that it's determined as the product of the hydrogen ion concentration and the hydroxide ion concentration, then if we know one, we can turn around and establish the other. So if I want to calculate the pOH, I need to understand that the pOH is going to be equal to 14 minus the pH. And that's because this relationship exists where 14 is equal to the sum of those two numbers. So in this case, since we know the pH is going to be 0.903, we can take 14 and subtract that pH and arrive at a value of 13.097. Now that we have figured out our pOH, this will allow us to calculate our hydroxide ion concentration. There are a couple of ways that you could figure it out already from the information given, uh, not the least of which is using the Kw equation and our already existing hydroxide ion concentration. But I'm going to use another manipulation of it, and I'm going to solve it using this formula here. And in doing so, I'm going to have a value of 10 raised to the negative 13.097, which will give me a value of 8.00 times 10 to the negative 14 moles per liter of hydroxide ions. But you've got to remember that this solution is acidic. So what we're going to notice is that we have an extremely high concentration of the hydrogen ions and a very low concentration of hydroxide ions. Acidic solutions are not devoid of hydroxide ions, nor are basic solutions devoid of hydrogen ions. It's just that there's a relatively large amount of one over the other when the solutions are not neutral. And here it makes sense that we have a higher concentration of hydrogen ions than we do hydroxide ions because we have determined that there's an excess of acid left over and therefore our resultant solution is acidic and not basic. So now you can see that the calculations that we have to perform even involving strong acids and strong bases, the types of acids and bases that we analyzed in grade 10 or grade 11, even though those reactions looked fairly straightforward in predicting salts and water being produced and a neutral solution, it is in fact not quite the case that it's that straightforward, especially when we have excess acid or excess base remaining, and when we have to start considering what the concentrations of hydrogen are and what the concentrations of hydronium are, and then ultimately using those to calculate pH and pOH. 
So hopefully after watching this, you have a little better understanding of how we can calculate the pH of a solution when we have an excess acid or base, and then how we can calculate the pH, pOH, hydroxide ion concentration, and hydrogen ion concentration from any one of those values. Thanks for watching.